everyone. We're going to go ahead and get started. Thank you so much for your patience. I know we got back from the uh, lunch a little bit late, but wasn't it dynamic? Right? Don't you feel 10 feet tall when you meet someone like Sandra Douglas Morgan, who is just making it happen, showing us what is possible, right? That's what this is all about, empowering each other. So I want to welcome you to this next session, and this is really important for a lot of reasons. You'll learn from this esteemed uh, panel that we have up here for you. You're going to walk away with some nuggets. I like to think of it as that Sandra kind of gave us an overall blueprint. These women are going to help you kind of hone in on exactly what you should be doing and at what stage. So before we get started, I'm going to go ahead and introduce myself. I am LaToya Silman, and I am an anchor at Channel 3, so thank you. Oh, we got, we got some viewers in the house. All right. I love that. Keep me employed. Keep watching. Uh, <laughs> In fact, you can, you can watch me at 12, 3, and 6 p.m. every single night, Monday through Friday. And um, in my own personal life, as Lindsay knows, uh, one of the esteemed panelists here, um, I'm also very, very passionate about uh, financial health. Um, I was one of those people who um, got into the television business, and for those who don't know, when you first break in, you are making, like, no money. I love to say that I was robbing Peter to pay Paul, every single month and I got myself in a world of debt. Um, I don't mind saying this because I've written about it and talked about it openly, but at one point I had 13 credit cards, uh, 13 maxed credit cards. And so um, I was able, uh, through Dave Ramsey and lots and lots of reading, I was able to uh, finally educate myself and break some cycles and maybe not shop so hard even though um, People tell me that I wear new clothes all the time, but I'm telling you, it's, it's in my budget. It's in my budget now. <laughs> it's in my budget. But I was able to not only get rid of all of my credit card debt, get rid of my student loan debt that I literally thought, because some of my family members told me, oh, you'll have that for the rest of your life. Don't even count that. Um, not true. Not true. You do not have to have it for the rest of your life. Paid off my car. I bought a house. I did all these things that I thought was just out of my reach only because I just did not know. And so when you know better, you do better, right? And so that's, right? that is what this is about. So we're investing in ourselves today. We're learning about investment, which I know that, that can be really, really scary because it's one thing to say, oh, get a budget. And a budget is not um, a bad thing. A budget is not a, a cuss word. A budget is just basically a plan for where you put your money. And I learned that the hard way, and I'm so glad that I was able to learn that and teach it to other people, eventually became a financial coach, and I talk about this and have a blog and did all that stuff in my own time, because that's how much I believe in this. I mean, you can, you can rock the clothes, you can have a cool job, but if you're broke, that's, that's no bueno. So we, <laughs> we, we want you to be able to have a future beyond just looking good and, and looking like you have a dollar. We want you to actually have something in your pocket, because I looked like I had some money. Um, and I did not have any. So, <laughs> I mean, it's just true. It's just the way it was. I, I, I owed uh, everybody and then some. Um, my paychecks were not my own, but thankfully they are mine, finally, again. All right, so one of the things that people may think, too, is like when I invest, how should I invest? Well, you should have probably started the sooner the better, as we heard Sandra talking about. So our, our crew is going to tell us about that. I'm so proud of the women that we have in front of us, including the first one, who is Lindsay Freeman. What we're going to do is have each one of them tell you a little bit, just like a quick little 30 seconds to 45 seconds of who you are, how amazing you are. But we'll start with Lindsay. She is a managing director for Westpac uh, Wealth Partners, um, and she's a bevy of knowledge on uh, financial planning and what you can do with your life, and she's going to tell us a little bit about her. And then we have Jessie Merritt. She is the senior VP for the Bank of Nevada for their community development. We also have Anna Salazar right there toward the end there. She is a VP of Alliance Leadership, and she also works for U.S. Bank and their goals coach manager. She's going to have some really, I have some really good questions for you, <laughs> just so you know. And then we have Dr. Kim Nels at the very end. She is from Lee Biz School. She also is a lecturer at UNLV. She has a, a bevy of information as well. So ladies, um, really quickly before we get to the tough questions, and you all will also be able to ask questions toward the end, so I'm going to be watching our time because I want to make sure that we're um, meeting your needs today. We're going to start with Lindsay. All right. 
great. Thank you so much. LaToya and I have had a chance to do some financial coaching together, and I was just telling her what a treat it is to have you as our moderator. So thank you all for being here. Like LaToya said, my name is Lindsay Freeman. I'm a wealth management advisor at Westpac Wealth Partners. I have been in the advising space for about 10, going on 11 years now. Um, so it's all I've ever really done career-wise. Uh, I was born and raised in Vegas. Do we have any other natives in here? <laughs> that is so funny because if I asked that question to a room of like this like five years ago, it'd be crickets. So like everyone's staying in Vegas now, which I love. Vegas is such a cool place to be. So born and raised in Vegas. I graduated from Bishop Gorman High School. Yay! Go Gales! Yay! <laughs> awesome. Um, and I have a finance degree from UNLV. UNLV! <laughs> Go Rebels! So I'm particularly really passionate about working with women, and the reason for that is I wholeheartedly believe that we as women are oftentimes missed when it comes to this conversation about money. And I think it's been a generational issue for a very long time. We're very familiar with the, the pay gap between men and women, but there's also this topic about the, the gender wealth gap that's going on. And really what that comes down to is we as women are investing less than men. And the statistic shows we're good savers. We're tucking money away. We're just not investing it. We're not putting our hard-earned savings dollars to work inside of the form of investment. So I think, you know, like LaToya said, the more we know, the better. And I think even for me, more education leads to more confidence. And I think just we as women and even just making the commitment to spend your entire day with us today is a really good first step in getting that education and getting that confidence. So thank you for being here. All right, Ms. Jerry. I'm Jerry Merritt. I'm Senior Vice President with Bank of Nevada. As a matter of fact, I've been in banking for over 45 years this year. Wow. <laughs> I am very excited to be here today as a speaker, but I am more excited to see all of you in the room. There may be many of you in the room that might remember, it seemed like a long time ago, but almost 11 years ago when Kate Marshall was our treasurer of the state, yes, and there was a women's money conference. And there was a conference very similar to this one that was actually put on for a full day to actually teach women about money. And of course, 11 years have gone by and many things have changed, but some of the issues that we have around money as women still exist. So I am excited that you all are here today, uh, investing in yourself and actually learning and hopefully will walk away today with little nuggets that you'll be able to take home and invest in your family also. My name is Anna Salazar. I work for U.S. Bank, and U.S. Bank has started about four and a half years ago a program called uh, Goals Coaching. So since its inception, I've been working uh, as managing a manager for the for the program. I've been in the financial industry for about 31 years, and the last 15 with U.S. Bank. And I love the fact that banks are finally understanding how important it is to not just provide the financial education and the coaching but to also make the services free and available to everyone. Because um, we know that sometimes if you're up there, you can have people advise you, but for everybody else who's working their way up there, it's very hard to find people that will give you the right advice um, and that can be there with you. I'm also a, an ICF um, accredited coach in financial wellness and positive psychology. And I'm also a certified uh, coach for uh, leadership and life. So, super excited to be here today and to have this opportunity. Thank you. Hi, everyone. I'm Kim Nels. I'm so excited to be here as well. And I have the great pleasure of serving as an assistant dean of external relations for the Lee Business School at UNLV. Go fight with! <laughs> I also get to teach classes in international business for the business school. I have students in this very room right now, and I love you all. I'm so excited to be here. Former students as well. Hi, Liz and others. I am just so excited every day to pour into the next generation, men, women, all students, that we can build a great Las Vegas economy because we need a great university, a great education 
to have a great city. And that's what I love to do every single day. One of the things and one of the initiatives I really want to give a shout out to that we're doing right now is we just created two new finance classes at UNLV, FIN 111 and 112, that are all about financial literacy. These are options for students, not just in the business school, but across campus. They can take it to meet one of their gen ed requirements. So you know how you have to take all your core curriculum. You now can take those core classes in financial literacy. So we are truly trying to make a difference every day, not just in the business school, but across campus and in the community. Thanks, and go Rebels! <laughs> Lots and lots of Rebel fans in here, and I love what you said about the fact that you guys are teaching financial literacy, because it's one thing to know how to, you know, well, not balance a checkbook anymore, I'm telling my age, but how to balance your account, but it's another thing about, okay, what should I be doing with my money, and I'm going to go a little bit off book, because I was going to start with Lindsay, but I want to talk to you, uh, Dr. Nails, really quickly. Why do you think it's so important for kids to walk out of school with that type of knowledge, not just the stuff that's going to help them get a degree and go on and, you know, have a job in their field, but to actually know how to manage their money. Right. And I would say, so I have t three teenagers, so I'm the least cool person on the planet, and I'm reminded <laughs> of that every single day and called a boomer. Uh, but they, they don't learn that type of street smarts in, the, in the, their classes every day at CCSD or wherever they happen to be, and I feel like it is essential for our students to come out with the knowledge and understanding of how to better themselves, how to make sure that they are investing in their own future so that they know that they need to pay themselves first, pay down their debts, take care of their own business, then give to others, make sure that they are doing the things every day to not only build themselves, but build their generational wealth for the future. And so I think it's essential that we teach these skills. And it, it could be balancing a checkbook, but it could also be creating a household budget. It could be creating a plan for, I want to go on vacation. How do I make that happen to make sure that I have the spending money to, to do that, or I want to buy a TV, or I want to uh, invest in a mortgage or a car, and what does that mean? Even student loans are really essential when students are taking on so much debt to go to school these days. We do have the lowest tuition in the country, but I digress. <laughs> uh, that you can you know, know how to make sure that you're making wise investments in yourself for the future and your own well-being. Yeah, and, and I love that you said that, but even when you do sometimes know um, the what, you may not know the how, um, and so that is when you might turn to someone like Lindsay and say, okay, how, how can I map out my financial future? And one of the things that I think Dr. Nils just said is that a lot of times we know, okay, I should save my money, but we're not necessarily investing our money. So when should we come to someone like you, Lindsay, and uh, say, okay, I need to invest, number one, why is it important? and how should we go about it? Yeah, absolutely, and before I dive into that, just to touch on your point too, I think that's really awesome. As I mentioned, I have a finance degree from UNLV, and I tell people all the time, like, and I kind of grew up around this stuff. My dad was a CPA, and I tell people, I didn't come out of college knowing how to invest money or save for retirement or pay my taxes or open up a business, so we all kind of get out into the real world, and we've got to figure all this stuff out on our own, so it's important that we get some education along the way, so I think that's really awesome that UNLV is doing that, and I think it's really foundational budgeting and things like that are so necessary. So yeah, back to your question. With So we have saving and we have investing. And I think that there are some boxes that we absolutely need to check before we have a permission slip to put our money in investment vehicles. So if we've kind of un unpacked that, what is saving and what is investing? So saving, obviously putting cash in a savings account. This is typically for the short term. So it's what I would call an emergency fund. So we're putting ourselves in a place where we can kind of self-insure life events that come up. So the transmission on the car breaks, we've got to buy a new washer dryer, something health-wise happens or job-wise happens. We've got at least six months worth of reserves in our emergency fund, and that is sitting in cash. Hopefully it's not under a mattress, hopefully it's in some sort of savings account. So it's short term, it's safe. There are very little risk, if any. 
But the downside on it is it's not growing, right? So, and obviously we're in an out of control inflation environment right now. I think we can all like feel that at the grocery store. So if we have money sitting there getting like 0.001% rate of return over a very long period of time, we're not even keeping up with the purchasing power of the dollar. So that's the downside on savings. And that's why I say have six months worth of reserves in a savings account. Any, anything above and beyond that could potentially be missed opportunity because we can't necessarily save our way to wealth. We have to invest. It's investing money that gives us a lot of power and a lot of control along the way. So if we unpack what is invest, investing, putting money in places where your hard-earned dollars are going to grow. Now, there are two really important kind of topics when it comes to investing and, and things to understand. And is one is it's risky. There is risk involved in investing, right? And when we're thinking the stock market, risk and return go together. So the riskier we are, the higher rates of return. But if we're in a market or an economic climate like we are in now or we're in last year, there's also downside risk. So we absolutely have to understand risk tolerance when it comes to investing. Uh, what is our objective behind investing? Is it Do we have a lot of time on our side? Is it for retirement? Are we putting money away to buy a home in three to five years? Obviously, what we invest in it's going to be very important based on what the objective is. So our goal with investing is we want to keep a long-term outlook, but we're getting growth on our money. So at least we can outpace inflation. So again, both are necessary, saving and investing. Obviously, the short-term savings, we've got to protect ourselves from emergencies, but investing is the way we increase our net worth and eventually reach our wealth goals along the way. Yeah, so you're making sure you stay away from those credit cards. <laughs> that will ultimately do you in. That's why you want that emergency service. Because guess what? Emergencies will happen, right? And just so you know, Christmas is not one of them. <laughs> I tell people all the time, you knew Christmas was coming. That is not an emergency. So you need to plan separately for that. <laughs> Jerry, let's go ahead and talk about some of the common types of investments that people could potentially look into. So as I was just listening to her presentation just now, she started off by saying savings is not investing. And I totally agree. But for many of us, the way to start to investing is by savings. So I would say the most common way to start investing your money is by actually having a savings account. There are many of us today that have a checking account because that's operational, that is where we put our money, but we do not save. So a regular savings account, where as in last year, did not have a great interest rate, have a better interest rate this year. So also, once you save some money in that account, you may want to then move on to a money market account because a money market account gives you just a little bit more interest, but it is still safe within a financial institution. And let me say this, as long as it's $250,000, <laughs> you're insured. And I know we're going through a lot of trauma, you know, right now as far as banks are concerned, but your savings account, your money market account, and then also there is your certificate of deposit. The interest rate on certificates of deposits also have increased this year because of what's actually going on in our economy. So if you're actually wanting to invest within your financial institution, start with your savings account, then to your money market, and then to your certificate of deposit. And of course, the other most common um, investments are your stocks and bonds, but I'm going to leave that up to ladies that understand it well. <laughs> yeah, and we have some questions about that too for uh, Lindsay. And I see you wanna jump in and I do have another question to follow up uh, once you finish saying what you wanted to say. Okay. Yeah, thank you. Mm -hmm. Anna was chomping at the bit. <laughs> Wait a minute. Um, so what I was thinking about is, where do we start though, right? We gotta start by building our habits. So part of budgeting, part of savings, and even investing is about making sure that we have the correct habits in place. And a lot of us need help establishing those habits or breaking bad habits of maybe spending or um, using all the money that's in our checking account, right? So part of what um, Kim had said earlier was pay yourself first. That begins, that's one of the earliest habits that we can begin building by putting money aside. Another thing that we need to look at a lot too is when we have a lot of decisions and a lot of options, we become paralyzed, 
right? So we get decision paralysis. What am I gonna do? What am I gonna pick? What's the best way to go? Break it down into little steps. So set a goal. Start with that goal, whether it's a savings or whether it's putting $1,000 in an investment account. Whatever your goal is, break it down into little pieces and work every day towards making those happen, towards building those habits, because those are the habits that are gonna help you when that investment is set up for you not to wanna go touch it and then pay penalties. That's what's gonna help you later on be able to continue to grow your financial wellness in a very sound way. And Anna, when you're doing that, helping people realize that they have to have the goals and the plan in place, how important is mindset before you even start to work that goal? It's huge. Um, we know as females, we know um, as minorities, we know um, just from different cultural backgrounds, we carry all these biases with us, right? And it's hard. So you gotta break through those biases. You gotta make sure that your mindset is a mindset of I can, and I am gonna get there. It may take me a little bit longer. I may have to make sure that every step that I take is a solid st uh, step that's gonna get me there. But you gotta know that you can do this, and you will, because then you'll find a way. You'll aid yourself with people that are positive, people that can help you, that can give you advice. You will be able to seek out companies, people that will be able to be there next to you. And a lot of times part of coaching, what we do is just being that accountability partner. Hey, did you really do what you say you were gonna do? Did you set that money aside? Not this week, all right, let's work on it next week. What can we change? What happened last week that we can change this week to help you get there? So you gotta really make sure that you're paying attention, that you're intentional uh, with what you're doing every day. And that. also that mindset is very individual. Uh, many of you may remember that um, I quite often teach a class on emotional spending. So when it actually comes to money, in order for you to be able to save it or invest it, you have to remember not to spend it. So spending is that mindset of, let me stop spending it here or spending it there so that I will be able to save it or invest it. For many of us as women, um, emotions run very strong. Whether we have money or not, we have a tendency to try to cure our emotional feelings with spending. And, I, and as I heard you say a few minutes ago, 13 credit cards. I am back in the day. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I'm willing to bet if you look back and think about it, the reasons why you had them and what you purchased was around the mindset or around the emotional part of what was going on with you at that time. So I totally agree when it comes to our finances, you have to have the right mindset to get started. Yeah, Lindsay, what did you want to add? I totally agree. I think mindset is everything and really what that comes down to is your rela individual relationship with money. And just to add to that, I think the, the advice that comes from the financial media is very different for women than it is for men. So the, the advice that's geared towards men is more of the real and the fun stuff, like make your money grow, invest, buy real estate, you know, purchase properties, build wealth. And then the advice that's geared towards women, unfortunately, is things like stop spending money and don't get that latte on the way to work and you need to budget. And so I think we're conditioned to kind of have this negative connotation around money, right? So I just think we, we need to figure out what our relationship is with money and move that in the positive direction. I think that that's absolutely mindset. And I'm so glad that you mentioned that because um, that was gonna go right into my next question to you because I think a lot of times we do think, and I thought this too, like I have to, you know, y'all, at one point I was literally eating off of $50 a week. I don't know how I did it, but I was doing it a lot of crock pot meals but then I had to switch my mindset because it's not so much about what I'm not supposed to be doing, but what can I be doing to grow my money? And one of the ways that you can do that is by having multiple sources of income that, like you said, a lot of women don't realize you can grow your money. I mean, in some cases, you're just not making enough money. I can attest to you when I was a reporter in Waco, I was not making enough money. So uh, sometimes it could just be a case that you just don't have enough. So how do you get enough? How do you go and make more? So let's talk about that. And investments, that is another source of income. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, let's talk about that a little bit more. Yeah, so to dive into investment in types, just kind of pick up where Jerry left off. Stocks, bonds, mutual funds, index funds, real estate, commodities, currencies. Is anyone pretty savvy with investments that could tell me like the difference between a stock and a bond? 
Anyone want to take a shot at it? Yep. Yep, you're exactly right. So when you think stock, think ownership. So when you buy a stock, you actually own a little tiny piece of that company. So you know if that company performs well, you're going to make money. But if that company performs poorly, you can lose money. So you're exactly right. There's more volatility, more risk when it comes to stocks, but higher rates of return. And then bonds is kind of the opposite. So when I say bond, I want you to actually think of debt. So when we buy a bond, what we're actually doing is we're loaning a company money. And what that company does in return is gives us back what's called a promissory note. And that note says in X amount of years, we're going to return your money back to you and give you a little bit of interest on top of that. So when we buy a bond, we're kind of like acting like the bank in that scenario by loaning money out and collecting interest on it later. So because of that promissory note, bonds tend to be a heck of a lot safer. So whenever I see someone with a lot of bond exposure in their portfolio, it usually means we're getting really close to retirement or we're in retirement. We're in a phase of life where we have to preserve wealth. And then in addition to that, I think the most efficient way to invest is by diversifying in index funds and mutual funds. We can, those are basically just huge baskets of different stocks and bonds, and they're weighted differently based on how conservative or how aggressive you as the investor can stand to be. Um, and while you still have the mic, what else would you say to folks about trying to just get started or to even get, um, I guess, a progress report? I mean, what should they do? Are there any low-cost options for them, consultations that they should take advantage of, that sort of thing? Yeah. So, I, and I'll plug Lisa Chastain. I don't know if anyone's had a chance to hear her yet. She, I love her. She has a great money coaching course, a couple of them. So if you're just starting out or you feel very, really well versed in your financial plan, like she has education for you. So I would vouch for that. And then if this is gonna sound biased, but I think everyone should have a financial advisor. And I don't think everyone thinks they can have one, but you can. And the reason I say that, and I think in economic climates like we are in now, makes it even more important important to have someone in your corner um, that has a, a handle on your financial plan, um, can make adjustments to your plan based on life changes. And I think there are a lot of boxes we need to check again before we start investing, like having a savings account, paying down debt. So having someone in your corner, and it's not expensive necessarily to have a financial advisor. I know they, you know, we're, we're paid differently based on what we do, but there are commission-based advisors, fee-based advisors. So do your research, get out there, interview advisors, find one that fits your personality. And it's literally someone that you want to have a relationship with, not only the rest of your career, but the rest of your life as you move into your retirement. So absolutely, financial advisors, and I think having that one-on-one -on -one coaching someone in your corner is really important. Okay, did anyone else want to add to that? Yeah, I would say if you are scared, which most women are much more conservative inv investors than men, it's just known widely that women are more conservative investors. If you're scared or if you just don't know where to start, you can take out a very small CD, Certificate of Deposit, and it is a guaranteed rate of return. You can look online. You don't have to even talk to anybody and say, hey, I have $100 or $1,000 or you know whatever small amount you want to start with. And some of the rates right now are 5%, 4.5% rate of return on a CD. These are some of the highest rates that we've seen, and we're hearing that interest rates may go up again this week. So when we hear interest rates go up, a lot of times it's talked about in scary terms, like that means our mortgage rates will go up, or um, we, you know, if we get a lease on a car, that rate might go up. But it also can help us too, and it can help us in the sense of savings. So if you want to just start simple, really simple. You can do this online. You can go to like, I don't want to put a plug in for any specific banks, but like a Synchrony account or an Alley Bank or one that doesn't even have a in-person store. You don't have to meet with anybody. Just get that CD. It can be for 12 months and you will be excited to see that rate of return with the 5% come back in a year from now. Okay, Jerry? Yes, the Feds did raise the interest rate today. Oh, today? Okay. <laughs> uh, about an hour ago. Uh, and yes, that would mean different things to us as far as our mortgages and our cars. But back to the conversation that we're a quarter, yes, a quarter, yes. So, but back to the conversation that we're having today, it can actually be positive because now the interest rate that you're getting on your savings will go up. 
And that CD that she was talking about just a few minutes ago, you can walk into your local bank where you actually have your checking account and now open up a CD where you can get a halfway decent uh, rate on it. So sometimes we see interest rate being raised is negative, but when it actually comes to investing or savings, we are at a point now where it can be an opportunity. Okay, while well, you have the mic. Um, you've been in the business, you said, 45 years. Uh, what have you noticed? Um, how was the business maybe, you know, five, ten years ago when it came to investment versus what you're seeing now in this current climate, especially since people tend to be more fear-based because they're worried about a possible recession. They're hearing, you know, unfortunately, we're talking about those things because we got to keep you guys informed in the news. Yeah. But what are you seeing differently as far as the climate of how investors are feeling or how people are feeling about their money and where they should put it? versus just five, 10 years ago? Well, I say in the financial service industry, it has always been a roller coaster, regardless of what age you're in. Many of you in the room will remember uh, 2008. <laughs> and you're probably, you might be having the feeling of 2008 right now, but I am here to tell you that it may feel like 2008, but it is definitely different. So the financial service industry are uh, investing uh, a money in general uh, is kind of a roller coaster. So you you got to know when to hold them and you got to know when to fold them. <laughs> actually, when it comes, you know, to money in general. And what I mean by that is you need to stay informed because our financial service industry is always changing. Uh, what we do in our investing is always changing. And like she said just a few minutes ago, investing in stocks could be risky. I have made some money with stocks when they're up. But we can't predict when what, a, what our economy is going to do or what the industry may be doing at that time. So I would say the change in the industry is something that you individually should always stay informed about because over the last five to 10 years, we've actually been on a roller coaster. We may be up for two to three years, but when you wake up on a Friday afternoon or Friday morning and find out that a bank has failed, it feels different. Yeah, and one thing that's important too for folks to realize is that um, you know, compound interest is a real thing. It's a beautiful thing, and so you want to start the sooner the better. And so um, I want to ask you, Anna, before we talk to the other panelists about how do you convey that to folks when we talk about goals? Because a lot of times people think, oh, I have to wait until this, or I'm going to give me six more months, give me another year, and before you know it, time has flown by and you've lost the beauty of compound interest in your 20s or your 30s, and now maybe you're in your latter 30s or 40s or maybe even 50s, and you're like, okay, I gotta get started. What do you tell them about, hey, let's do this now as opposed to putting it off for any other day? I think um, being prepared is very important. We've been talking about it. Preparing for retirement in particular is very important, and the best way to do it is through having your, your investments and starting now, a little bit, a lot, it doesn't matter. Um, it starts building those habits, it starts building up the money. Now there's different investment strategies, whether you're in your 20s, 30s, 40s, even 50s, um, and the experts can talk about that. But you need to put yourself first, and the time is now. So when we talk about goals, um, everybody's heard about SMART goals, right? And the T is time bound. Any goal that you're serious about reaching, it's gotta have some sort of timeline for you. And this is no different and you start now. Okay, Lindsay, I, I think I can feel you want to say something. No, I'm good. Okay, she's like, no, I'm good. Okay, what about you, Dr. Nels, when you're talking to these students, any red flags that you tell them they should look out for, anything? Because it's one thing to say, okay, get out there and go, but, but there are some shysters out there that might try to get your hard-earned dollar. Sure, so I, I think that's why it's so important to do your homework, whether it's talking to a financial advisor, doing your own homework on the internet, taking classes. You can, of course, take them through UNLV, but you can also <laughs> take them through, you know, just taking courses online through Coursera or EDX or other great resources. I mean, there is no shortage of opportunity today with YouTube and all the great free learning opportunities that are out there. Definitely tap into your library. Can't say enough great things about our library district here in town. 
I, I just feel like there are books and materials available. You have to educate yourself. Take it upon yourself to, whether it's watch a, a YouTube video um, that's not cat related once a day, that's something to do with <laughs> finances, it will, it will make you a smarter investor. So I think red flag is just take it upon yourself to, to learn and, and take those classes, do what you need to do to just get to know how to better own your money. Make it work for you rather than the other way around. You can work to earn, you can work to learn. And I think it's important to do both. Okay, Lindsay uh, what, has some, oh, go ahead, Jerry, sorry. <laughs> As you speak about UNLV and being able to get the information in the library and actually online, I think one of the other things that we need to think about is we have children, most of us as women. And financial literacy should start very early. As a banker, uh, we spend quite a bit of our time actually going into the schools, uh, whether it's through Junior Achievement or some of the other organizations, teaching financial literacy to second and third graders. You know, and at first it was like, what do they know about money? But if you start teaching them at a very early age, then they will actually know how to manage their money by the time they get to be a teenager, by the time they get to be, be in college. And someday when they're in a room like this, they will be very aware of what money is, how to use it, how to save it, and invest it. So sometimes as parents, we don't spend quite enough time with financial literacy and our young people but we can actually help the generation coming up behind us by teaching them up front so they can learn quickly. So I was switching gears back to your point about shysters. I, I think there's a really important thing to address. I think that's a major area where the finance industry fails people like yourselves is unfortunately there are bad financial advisors out there and bad financial companies. We hear these things in the media, the Bernie Madoff scandal, Ponzi schemes that are going on. What went on last year with FTX, it was like a huge cryptocurrency Ponzi scheme with ultra high net worth people that we think are really smart and like how did this happen to them? So it's out there and I think it's really important to address and I wholeheartedly think that really the number one reason you should work with a financial advisor is because you can trust that person. You may not understand every intricacy of asset allocation inside of your portfolio, but if you can trust that person, at least you're starting off on the right foot. So again, do you, I mean, you can look up financial advisors. Like you can Google me and find out my licenses. Um, you could find out if a financial advisor has ever been sued or had disclosures or been in tr any trouble. So do your research, make sure you're working with the right person. Okay, um, anything, Lindsay, before we, open it up to questions just like really quickly um, if you're like okay I'm ready to invest or I don't know if I've invested enough what's the first thing you should do when you leave today so I have five steps that I want like boxes that you should check before you were thinking to take that step to investing so that first one is organization so making sure we have a handle on the budget so budgeting where's money going how much is coming in versus what's going out the second thing is protection. Do we have proper insurances? Are we gonna have a life event come in that wipes out all of this money that we're trying to build? So protection insurances, legal documents like estate planning. The next one is having your emergency fund, so saving, making sure we're capturing enough of your income and we do have an emergency fund. The next thing is obviously paying down debt, getting bad debt off your balance sheet. And then that fifth thing, that last thing we reach is investing. So all of those things, those boxes are our permission slips to start investing. So if you have those boxes checked, I, the best next step is to probably work with an advisor. I think there's a ton of blanketed financial advice out there that you can find, like invest in an index fund in the S&P 500, and that may work, but it may not align with your individual goals. So I think if you've checked all those boxes and you're ready to take that next step, then a financial advisor is, is a great natural next step. Okay, does anyone have any questions? We'll open it up really quickly. Okay, I'll go over there. I'll take that mic, Lindsay. Thank you. Okay. Hi, Keisha. So this question is for, your name is Lindsay, right? So I, it may sound ignorant, the question, but I'm going to ask it anyway. So off of your five checklist thing that you should have before investing, you were saying like credit card, your debts and all that be down. 
why does that matter if you're trying to make money? Why does it matter how much debt you have on a credit card if you're able to make your minimum payment, you know, you're not, even though they don't be frowned upon and take you forever to pay it off, but if you're able to still make your minimum payment, why should that hinder you from investing to make more money than to the, you can take that money to maybe pay it off completely? Yeah, really good question. And it's because bad debt, high interest debt like credit cards are typically in the 20s probably was your experience. So that's costing you more money than you are potentially making in the stock market. So there's like a negative opportunity cost that's happening there. So if we invest our money in the market, we get a 10% rate of return, but we've got a balance sitting on a credit card that we're being charged 20% on, then we're actually losing money, even though our investments are doing well. So priority-wise, let's get bad debt off and stop that kind of erosion of money before we're starting to put money at risk. That makes sense? Not really. <laughs> <laughs> She's basically saying you don't want ma bad money after good. Yeah. Well, no, you don't have to have debt. That's what she's saying. You put your money into something that's going to grow your money instead of taking your money, especially when it's like, what, 27% some of these credit yeah. cards? 29 and Oh, Lord. All right. That's expensive money. All righty. <laughs> My question is for Ms. Jerry. Um, one of the statements you made was very... Um, very prominent, it said stay informed. And what you did earlier was very impressive. You were talking about the um, rates that had just went up and you were like right on it. You were like, yeah, it went up a quarter. <laughs> and I'm just <laughs> like, where do we go to find knowledge and how would you suggest we stay informed? What, what avenues do we take? Do we follow the stock market? Do we go to certain websites? Like what areas will we do to stay informed or look at, look for? Well, um with everything going on in the financial service industry right now, it's not hard to stay informed. You know, so just pay attention to as many financial articles as you can actually find. You can actually go on the internet and just Google the question you may have. You know, so uh, staying informed not only mean reading, uh, consulting your financial planners, or just getting information in general. Uh, say today with the interest rate actually going up, uh, that's actually in the media. Pay more attention. When you hear the word finance or you hear the word banking, you know, in general, pay attention because sometimes we just have a tendency to think that's happening to them, but not anymore. What's happening in our financial industry today affects all of us whether it be from your saving to your mortgage to, to whether you're buying a car or whatever you're doing with money. Uh, we're affected by it. Watch News 3. <laughs> I bet you we have that story on today, and we have a financial story pretty much every day. And then also to that point, when you're Googling, make sure that you're watching and listening to credible sources. There are so many people that are on the Internet. Everyone's a journalist. No, they're not. So uh, make sure, just like you can look up Lindsay, and she has to back up what she's saying, um, we can't just tell you anything on News 3. We will get sued, um, not only the station, but me personally. So uh, we have things in place. Um, so you want to make sure that just some Joe Smo that's like, hey, I used to do such and such, and now I'm a financial guru. No, well, show me your credentials. Why should I believe what you're saying? So watch News 3. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Six o'clock. So good, good afternoon. My name is Dawn Hubbard, and I know it's very important that we diversify when we think about savings and uh, kind of growing for retirement. Can any of you comment on um, what I'm hearing a lot now about infinite banks? Yeah, so infinite banking is typically like a permanent life insurance type strategy. So believe it or not, and it's kind of a crazy concept, but it's one of the the most important and biggest legal loopholes in the tax code is saving money inside of a life insurance policy. Is anyone familiar with that or has done that? I'm yeah. Yeah. So, and and it's life insurance is one of the most complicated things out there. If you try to get on Google and type in how much life insurance coverage do I need? What type of policy should it be? What kind? What company should I go through? You're going to get one million different opinions on it. And if not done properly life insurance and kind of investing in it can be very risky. Um, 
depending on what the market's doing, you can lose a policy and things like that. So you want your life insurance to be a safe place. And the reason I say it's such a, a loophole in the tax code is saving money in life insurance is almost like a, a Roth IRA on steroids, if you will. All distributions from life insurance, if done properly, are completely tax-free. So those of you who are over the income limit to have a Roth IRA, that's a really good backup strategy. Um, or if we're, you know, a Roth, obviously we're capped at 6,500 a year. We can't put any more than that into a Roth. So if we're needing to save additional tax-free money, permanent life insurance is also a good place to do that. So it's called infinite banking. It's kind of, there's like, be your own banker, infinite banking, these kind of like corny um, things people call it. Um, but really what it is is you, you end up kind of building this cash value inside of a life insurance policy that you can borrow against throughout your life. So you put yourself in a position where if I want to buy a new car or even a house, I'll just borrow against my life insurance. It's like a loan to myself instead of going out to a bank and paying a higher interest rate and borrowing money from a bank. So that's where the kind of infinite banking concept comes from. Any other questions? Oh, in the back. Okay, I'm going to get all the way. I saw your hand first. So I'm going to go all the way to the back. I feel like Oprah. I always wanted to do this. <laughs> Thank you. Um, so after you get yourself to the point where you've already set aside a savings reserve, six months reserve, you've gotten your credit card debt in a good place, and you're able to make that initial investment, what does that minimum amount look like? And if it, and if you say it's under 5,000, what are the smaller vehicles you could start with if you're a new investor just trying to get into the market? I know some financial advisors do have minimums, like to walk into some of these bigger wirehouse banks, you have to have a quarter of a million dollars, and that's why people, a lot of people don't do it. Um, I particularly, and my firm as a whole, don't have minimums, so I love to start with people like yourself who are, who are just starting out from literally zero. Um, but if you're doing it on yourself, I mean, some of these lower cost platforms like E-Trade and TD Ameritrade and some of these bigger banks um, have index funds where you can put $50 a month into them if you want to. So typically, if you're doing it on your own with brokerage accounts or retirement accounts like that, there's not a particular minimum that you'd need to worry about. Okay. <laughs> Hi, thank you. My name is Rondalyn McClintock, Ronnie. And my question is around... Um, where you get information. Are there any specific like podcasts or things that you can recommend for uh, folks like me who want to consume this information in bite-sized chunk chunks, <laughs> but that's accurate? Yeah, so every day I listen to HBR IdeaCast. That's Harvard Business Review IdeaCast. That's a great first option and a great way to start your day as you're getting ready in the morning. Um, I also love Rachel Rogers. I don't know if anyone's familiar with her, but she has a company called Hello7. Wrote a great book. I highly recommend her book. Um, she is really all about personal investing and building seven-figure-plus wealth. And I, I think she just uh, really speaks from the heart. So I would recommend her as well. Um, My First Million is a great uh, another podcast if you're um, interested in podcasts. But I, I think there's a lot of wonderful podcasts that are out there to listen to, whether finance related or not. I mean, you know, I'm always one that loves a great true crime podcast, too, so I can <laughs> recommend those as well. But uh, <laughs> I know that's a different uh, panel I'll be on later talking about murder mysteries. Okay. <laughs> Hi, ladies. And U.S. Oh. Bank also has a pod. Oh, sorry. Oh, sorry. Go, ahead. Go, go ahead. Go U.S. Ahead. Bank also has a podcast. It's called The Really Good Podcast, and it's on financial topics. Not always is it investing, but um, it will keep you up to date on, on different topics really good podcast. <laughs> That's the name. That's the name. Okay, we have a question back here, and then I'll make my way up. 
Okay, good afternoon, ladies. Um, I'm a little embarrassed to answer, ask this question and also being a little bit vulnerable um, with regard to money because I was not raised with the proper money mindset. And so at this big old age that I am now, I'm just now trying to learn and teach myself and, you know, research and different things like that. And so my goal had been to pay down my credit card debt so that I could use my credit cards as my emergency fund. Is that the wrong mindset? I see Miss Jerry shaking her head already. <laughs> I think Anna wants to answer that one. And the first thing I want to say is thank you very much for stepping up and asking your question. Mm -hmm. Because I bet there's a lot of other people in the room that have the same question as well. Always focus on trying to pay off your debt first. And then with the extra money as we've been talking about, set money aside. Um, some of us were taught that the credit card was for emergencies, right? And then boom, one emergency, boom, another one, and another one, and the next thing you know, it's a hole. So there's different ways in which you can separate your money and plan for it, and it's budgeted, and it's already there. And then leave the credit cards as its own, its own separate thing and try and, and pay those off as soon as possible. It, it's only gonna be better for you. And if you need help, um, let us know. We can set you up with uh, free coaches that can assist you with that as well. You're nice. welcome. I love that. For many of you, you might have taken uh, Dave Ramsey, as you mentioned earlier. Um, and one of the things that he recommends, especially when it comes to credit cards, is a snowball effect to actually get your credit cards paid off. And always have that emergency fund. And we think of an emergency fund as, oh, I gotta have a lot of money just in case I may have an emergency. Not necessarily. You can start an emergency fund with as small as $100. Just start, keep adding to it so that you will have enough cash actually set aside that if you have an emergency, you can use that cash even though you have a credit card. Yeah, and the snowball, just for those who may not know, that's when you start with the smallest amount that's owed. You pay that, you throw as much as you can toward it, then after you pay that off, you add that money plus the minimum to the next biggest number, and you start paying that off. And that's how I paid off my debt, actually. And it really does snowball, and before you know it, you're like, oh my gosh, how did I get here? And you, you don't miss that money. I mean, a lot of people may think, oh my gosh, you know, I'm, I'm used to doing this or doing that. For me, I had a lightweight shopping problem. But um, <laughs> I don't know if you can tell I like clothes. But, uh, but yeah, it, it really goes that way, but you gotta have that emergency fund, because what's the good of paying that off if you just rack up your credit cards again, which I've done twice, right? And so then you're right back where you started. And as they mentioned, the, the interest rates are so high, especially on those credit cards, you're just paying too much for it. It's too expensive. Hi, my name is Crystal. Lindsay, will you educate us a little bit on the different ways financial advisors are paid? Yeah, absolutely. So there's a couple different ways. And typically, if we keep it kind of simple, there's commission-based advisors and fee-based advisors. I would steer clear a little bit on commission-based advisors because they, they cost more and they may not have your best interest at heart. Um, and I started my career at a firm that did it like this and that's why I didn't work for them anymore. So what that is, is they'll charge a commission to open an account. So you're typically putting money into a new account at a 5%, what they call sales load, so it's a commissionable share. So the advisor just made 5%, but you've just started your new investment account at a negative 5% rate of return. Um, the other way these commission-based advisors make money is if they rebalance your account. So every time you put money in or rebalance, they're making money. They don't charge a, fee, a flat fee, so they don't necessarily have any bias to make sure your account goes up, right? So you're having an annual meeting with that person. They say, We've, we should rebalance your account. And you're thinking, do we need to rebalance my account? Or are you making a commission from doing that? So I'd be careful. And the reason some advisors are commission-based is they're, they don't have the licenses to be fee-based. So they're kind of playing in the minor leagues when it comes to investment licenses. So I would vouch for a fee-based advisor. Uh, a fee-based makes no commissions. There's no commission, no sales load on opening a new account. I don't make any, and I'm a fee-based advisor, I don't make any money if you rebalance your account. I charge a 1% annual flat fee on money that I manage for clients. So that 1% fee comes directly out of the account. It's not an invoice that you pay, um, and it's not discretionary, so it never changes, so there's no surprises. 
That was a good question. All right, we have room and time for just one more, I hate to say, because I see all the hands going up, but you'll be the last question. Uh, hello, thank you for uh, speaking with us and taking the time to be here. You mentioned that investing can be a source of, in, of income. What are some ideas on multiple sources of income? Yeah, so creating residual income. And I think what we have to keep in mind here is creating residual income, it doesn't happen overnight. It's not like a get rich quick type thing. I think probably the quickest way we could do that is purchase real estate and put renters in them and start creating residual income that way. Or short term rentals like Airbnb. There's even Turo, buying cars and putting them on Turo and renting that out and get profitable that way. And then I think even a longer term gig is the stock market. So if we invest for long periods of time, um, we can eventually produce residual income. It's just not a short-term outlook when it comes to the stock market. And I think, I think that's why a lot of people kind of struggle with understanding the stock market is because it's like literally backwards from our rational thinking as human beings because the, the way it works is it, it's really, really difficult to predict on a short-term basis, but it's actually very easy to predict on a long-term basis. As human beings, that's kind of the other way around for us, right? It's easy to predict the short-term, not so much the long-term. So we have to be careful with short-term. And when I say long-term outlook, it's typically 10 years. If you can stay disciplined and stick to an investment philosophy for about 10 years at a time, you're going to be able to create a lot of predictability around the outcome and the rates of return. So things like that, real estate, stocks, bonds, commodities, but keep a long-term outlook. Anything else anyone wants to add before we go? I love you all. Aw, I love that. <laughs> Let's give them a round of applause, some great information. I hope you all learned something today, and I hope you'll take it and apply it, because that's the most important is to apply the knowledge that you've learned and keep it up. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank we appreciate you. it. You too.